So again, it should be fairly obvious when I move this forwards, move this up, that the modern human cranial capacity is, is smaller than the Cro-Magnon specimen. And again, what's happened is that you've got a development of, of the Cro-Magnon skull posteriorly, so it's, it's moving further back um, than the modern human skull. And again, if we just look from this angle, we're seeing something quite interesting. There, this difference in cranial capacity becomes quite obvious. And you'll notice also that there are some interesting differences in, in the sutures, although I'm not sure how accurate these are in the reproduction, um, although I, I would imagine they're fairly accurate. But in the modern human skull, you've got fairly straight few kind of curves, or sinus waves I like to think of them as, whereas in the Cro-Magnon specimen you have a big squiggly line uh, moving all the way through, uh, separating the different um, plates, cranial plates. Now this is a comparison of the modern human with a Neanderthal skull and this Neanderthal skull just goes back and back and just kind of expands out at the back which is quite incredible really. The, I mean it's fairly obvious, there's an almost egg shape uh, to, to the human skull from this angle. But here what we have is it's filling out towards the towards the back. Now this filling out I think is quite interesting because it looks to be the area where temporal lobe joins to the occipital cortex. In other words, this is the area where the region of the brain which is related to memory is impacting on the occipital cortex, the part of the brain that's related to vision. And this is a characteristic of the late Pleistocene Neanderthals and also, funnily enough, of some of the Cro-Magnon specimens from that period of time. So they almost seem to be following each other in, in adaptation terms. The question is, what would the endocast look like at this point? What changes would this actually make to the brain? Is, is this really meaning that the Neanderthal brain is expanding out in the vision part of the brain? Um, and similarly for the Cro-Magnon. So, uh, the, the similar shape of late Pleistocene Cro-Magnon skulls suggests, to me at least, that there must have been some interbreeding going on through that time. So I'm just going to just give one 
final run through, so that's the Neanderthal. That's the modern human. And that's the Cro-Magnon. And what I'm really thinking here is that the Cro-Magnon is looking more like the Neanderthal in terms of the extension of the occipital parts of the skull compared to modern humans where really this shape is just being lost and this would kind of make sense in terms of a um, hybridization between early humans leaving Africa and Neanderthals as they move up through the Middle East and into Europe where these places are just completely dominated by by Homo neanderthalensis I mean these uh, early humans are just coming into into Eurasia an area just completely dominated first of all by Homo erectus and then by Homo heidelbergensis and then completely dominated by Homo neanderthalensis so what seems to be happening perhaps is that the human brain skull is is moving back into into the direction it was originally um, going in the trajectory before meeting with these archaic humans okay thank you I would just like to add that really you can't make these kind of comparisons very uh, solidly using single specimens so I've been slightly naughty here giving these examples because what you need to do is, is look at the population averages but what I hope to demonstrate here is that even when you've got large variation within populations when you take a human skull and you compare it with a, a Neanderthal skull we're looking at, at two distinct adaptations to, to the environment with, uh, 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 with the gestalt, that's the entire picture taking into account all of the tiny variations making a significant difference in the whole 